Okay, the day has come, and it's actually past now, because it's almost midnight, but okay. It is the day of the Hobbit. That's right, December 14th, today, or yesterday, or whatever day you're watching this, four years ago for all I know, was the day of the premiere of The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. I saw it tonight, and my first reaction was... Look, I can deal with that. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, it's uh, definitely not perfect, and I nor was I expecting it to be perfect. I, you know, let's say it like this. The Lord of the Rings is one thing. It's a trilogy. It's it's all, you know, uh, a flowing story. Uh, of course it's fine if you make it into a trilogy. The Hobbit, on the other hand, is another deal. This is where two things clash. Studio Heads and Peter Jackson. Of course Peter Jackson wants to make everyone who watches the film happy. So he wants to make sure that all the major details and anything... Uh, minor that that the fans would just absolutely kill him without being in the film uh, are there but at the same time the studio heads are pressuring him because they want to make as much money as possible off of this series and of course studio heads know three is better than two so that's why the Hobbit has now been expanded you could say into three films instead of the original idea for just two um, I don't know, this this review will be really unorganized. The other ones, I, I had a script to work off of. This is totally unscripted. Uh, so if I, I kind of ramble about something and then and then uh, I get completely off the point, then I go to a different point that was connected to the last one and it doesn't make sense, that's why. Okay, uh, I guess I'll start at the beginning. The first uh, you know, few minutes of the film uh, were kind of uh, reintroduced to Middle Earth and we get uh, a scene of... Uh, the dwarves, uh, their great, you know, uh, um, hidden treasure, you know, secret, whatever, uh, whatever you, you want to call it, uh, being attacked by Smog the dragon, and uh, right away the title screen, you know, it had the, the, you know, you know, all these studios present and stuff, and and in Lord of the Rings they were always kind of like this bluish white color, and now it's this golden uh, yellow color, and it's. And then they showed the Hobbit title screen, and the music was coming up. I had a smile on my face as big as Saturn. It was it was just really... I was so happy to be there. I was like, it's here. Finally, the Hobbit's here. I have been waiting forever to come back into a movie theater and hear this music and see something from Middle Earth. And it was fantastic. Uh, as the film went on, that smile slowly, slowly just kind of just, you know, diminished. But uh, but by the end, it, it started to come back up again. So that's, that's, a, that's a good, that's good. Um, the first thing uh, that I want to say as far as complaints go about the film, uh, the first thing, and this is universal, I think everybody, or just about everybody, has criticized the film for this reason. It's too long for such a small part of the of the Hobbit, the book, it's way too long. I felt its length at an hour in. At an hour in, I was looking at my watch every five minutes or so, saying, "Okay, okay, this has been on for an hour. Okay, well they've barely gotten anywhere. It takes forty minutes uh, to um, actually start the journey." Okay, I understand. That fanboys love to see every detail, you know, craftfully put into the to the series. But this is what happens when you do that. Uh, um, the best example I can think of that did it better was Harry Potter, the first two especially. Yes, they had almost every last single point uh, in the book, and they only cut out a couple of them. But at least they were able to condense them to the point where you got the basic scene, but it wasn't half an hour of the movie, you know? Literally, it's about 10, 15 minutes in when we finally get An Unexpected Journey, the title that we usually get in these in the Ring films, too. 
Um, and then it kind of flashed back, you know, to the to where the film starts actually, uh, with young uh, Bilbo played by Martin Freeman. I, I'm going to talk about Martin Freeman here in a second, and where he uh, uh, gets introduced to Gandalf and the whole journey begins. Um, okay, I, uh, let me just let me just say this uh, about Martin Freeman's performance. I am not too familiar with him. I do not watch way too much television, um, especially not this uh, this Sherlock series that he's famous for. There's a Sherlock uh, Sherlock Holmes series he's famous for, but I don't watch it. Uh, Sherlock Holmes is, has been one thing that I just just haven't been able to get into. I've been desperately wanting to pick up a book by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle or watch one of the Robert Downey Jr. movies, but I just there's always an obstacle there that I that it's the you know weird reasons where I, where I uh, can't watch it or I don't want to watch it, uh, but um, but I was almost introduced to him with this film. Man, he did an impressive job. Uh, what's sad is that for a majority of the film, he's in the background. That's really sad. I felt like. Uh, the dwarves, all 13 dwarves, their screen time just wasn't well planned out at all. We have Thorin Oakenshield, who is, of course, the, the leader of the company. He's the main guy. It makes sense that we focus primarily on him. We also get a lot of Balin, uh, who is uh, actually Gimli from Lord of the Rings, uh, his uh, cousin. And we have Glowin, who's his father, who we... I couldn't tell him apart from the ten other dwarfs that were there. Um, the only one, and the only other one I noticed was Feely, and that's because he was pretty much this film's uh, Legolas. And the only reason for that being was because they went with a hot young actor who looks good on camera and fires bows and arrows, you know. But uh, and the rest of them, I could name, I could tell you, tell you uh, their names, but I can't match up a face to them. Uh, their performances were fine, and I thought that the film uh, utilized just the presence of all these dwarves kind of in a chaotic way, fine. Uh, for example, we're introduced to a few dwarves, you know, individually, and then, like, five or six of them are introduced to us at once. That was, you know, that was in the opening of the film, actually, and that was, that was okay. But, uh, but yeah, I just... It felt like there were way too many new characters shoved on us all at once. Uh, because this Bilbo character is way different from Ian Holmes' Bilbo from the Ring series. Because he hasn't gone on this great adventure that he's always talked about yet. It's, you know, it, it hasn't even started yet. So, in a way, this new actor is actually playing a new Bilbo. It's a new, totally different character. So that's 14, at least 14 characters that were shoved on to, that are shoved onto us right away that we have to suddenly remember their names, what they do, you know, and so on. Um, and the only way I can tell them apart is by race and by some of them, their first names. Um, really though, it's, uh, I don't know how you could have fixed that, but it's just, for two hours and 46 minutes of film, I still haven't learned all the dwarfs' names, and I can't, well, I, I've learned their names, I just can't tell every single one of them apart, which is uh, something I was hoping, actually, I was able to do. But, of course, I'll have rewatched it by the time the second movie comes out next December, so hopefully by then I can tell them all apart. But, uh, but yeah, right off the bat, I think, and if you look back at uh, Fellowship of the Ring, um, yeah, there's the Fellowship. But we already, by the time the Fellowship is formed, we already know Gandalf. We already know the Four Hobbits. We already know Aragorn. That leaves three people that we have to be introduced to. Three. Not fourteen. Yeah, that, that was, that was a, a thing that I was kind of... That was the biggest thing for me. It was right off the bat I said, there's no way people can keep all these characters straight if they're walking in fresh to this. And... Do I recommend it for people who just want to jump in now that this new series has kind of kick-started? I say if you're willing to know just right off the bat that there are a few, there are a few blanks that are going to come in, like you're going to say, well, why is the audience laughing when this Frodo character comes in in the beginning and then he's not in the rest of the movie? What about this 
you know, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, if, just be prepared if you're fresh into this and you've never seen a Lord of the Rings film or you're too young, you know, the films came out before you were born or whatever, just remember, there's going to be a few blanks. Uh, so don't, don't feel ashamed and don't feel bad if, if you're kind of confused at first. Um, I have to say, though, that uh, Ian McKellen is back, of course, as Gandalf. And in the first trailer, when I first saw his face, of course, ten years has passed since uh, Lord of the Rings. Ian McKellen has grown older, and this takes place 60 years ago. And yet it looks like it takes place 60 years after Lord of the Rings. But uh, there's nothing we can do about that. But he gave as good a performance as he's given through the rest of the series. And he actually, I think, morphs into the main character after the first two acts. And then he kind of vanishes for a little bit, and then he comes back. But, uh, but yeah, I thought uh, definitely the lead character in this uh, was questionable. Like, I never felt like Bilbo didn't get enough to do in the first two acts to secure him as the main character. Um, and it wasn't until the third act that he finally got his, you know, bigger moments. Um... I don't know what else to say. Uh, Richard Armitage, I think that's his name, plays Thor and Oakenshield. His performance, I thought, was really good. Uh, once again, I don't really, I'm not too familiar with him, uh, but uh, I was really, really glad to see that that uh, there are a few really good performances behind this as well. Not to say that that the Rings films didn't have those. These, this has it as well. But um, but yeah, and then. Uh, I don't know, the film's pace was probably the biggest problem. It, it started off very slow, very slow. Uh, I can understand, like, The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, that's another example I could have used where uh, people say there's too many characters that we have to be introduced to. I count three. Make that four, sorry. I count four. And it's not way too hard to, you know, to... Uh, to tell them apart, and it's not too hard to get into their characters, because we know them by 15 minutes in. But, uh, but yeah, um, I don't know, it started off at a snail's pace, and then toward about the hour and a half point, then things started to pick up a little bit. It was close to halfway. Then it started to, to you know, the train that was pulling this story, then people started adding coal to the fire. Then it started to go. And then when it went, then it was very, very entertaining. Then it got up to the quality that we were expecting it to be. But until then, it was just, uh, just trudging, trudging, trudging along. And it just, yeah, that's when I felt bored, that's for sure. Um, but they definitely make up for it. There's a scene that I'm going to get to here in a little bit that as I was watching... I felt as entertained as a lot of key moments in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, actually, uh, which I was not expecting in the least, and, uh, well, certainly not up to that point, but uh, we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, I have to talk about the almost cameo roles that we get in this. I mentioned Frodo before he's in the beginning and then not shown again. Uh, Elijah Wood is fine, and Ian Holm, they're, they're both fine and everything. But then, about an hour and a half in, we get in, reintroduced to um, Elrond, and what they did with him to make him look younger, it's not like they digitally enhanced anything, like they did on Harry Potter, for example, where they tried to make him look, you know, 20 years older. Uh, just makeup. And he, you know, that was actually a nice transformation. But Hugo Weaving is still relatively uh, somewhat young. You know, you might consider, I was trying to think of a relatively popular phrase, and then Kate Blanchett looked fine, and then Christopher Lee, I swear to God, they had to have done something to him, because he definitely, you know, they, and of course, probably digitally, you could tell his beard was, there was still some gray in it, it wasn't pure white, like it is in the Rings film, uh, so, um, but yeah, all three of those actors did a really nice job in these basically cameo roles, but Kate Blanchett probably got the biggest out of all of them. Because if you see the trailer, she's got a scene where she kind of talks to Gandalf a little bit. But uh, but Christopher Lee, man, he he does a good job. And what's surprising to most people that, that don't realize this, this is the film where he's actually a good guy. This is before he turns to evils, you know. So, uh, so it's kind of weird. You're sitting there and you're like, 
you're kind of threatened by him because you know he's the you know you know you're saying that's a villain, that's a villain, but he doesn't do anything bad. His cameo, you know, he starts a little bit, he talks a little bit, and then he's out. So, so yeah. But uh, but yeah, that scene was uh, and, and the scenes in Rivendell were well staged. They looked fantastic. Um, you know, visualized production de uh, design wise, everything looked fine. Probably one of the chief complaints that separates this from the Rings films is back when they were shooting Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, CGI had not fully developed yet. In The Hobbit, you can tell CGI has definitely fully developed. And a lot, not all, but a lot of the scenes or locations they use for New Zealand, say, in Lord of the Rings, are replaced by digital stuff. There's only, I think there's a few shots here and there where they're journeying and, you know, they're really long shots, like they're way out here and they're tiny and the camera's back here, where it's all digital. Uh, I don't like that stuff. It's a gimmicky way to waste money on special effects. You know, it, it takes away from the realism, uh, but, but it looked fine. The, the visual effects definitely were impressive. Uh, what they did on the, uh, kind of the texturing of, uh, there's an orc character, what they did on the texturing, and they kind of scar up his face and his body and stuff, that looked, that looked good, even though I could obviously tell it was fake, it looked good. And that's the other thing is, definitely there's a lot of CGI in Lord of the Rings trilogy, but here in The Hobbit, it's just like, <sighs> almost overused. Uh, like the makeup they use on the orcs and all the, uh, trilogy, in the trilogy, a lot of the orcs have makeup, you know, only, you know, in the big crowd scenes, of course, that's CGI, and, and there's a few of them that are CGI, you know, here and, and again, but here it felt like they picked out like five or six orcs, or, uh, or um, yeah, just orcs, and they said, let's put makeup on, and the rest we'll put in digitally, uh, which I think is a shame. I think they should stick to traditional filmmaking back when, you know, way back when, when they didn't have all this technology, all this stuff. But, uh, let's see. I don't know where else to go with this without moving on to the later stuff. Um, okay, we'll get to this this scene I've been, <laughs> I've been anxious to talk about now. But, of course, everybody remembers. And my one of my favorite parts of the book, The Hobbit, which evidently wasn't so fresh, because there were a few characters and moments here and there where I'm like, did that happen in the book? book? I can't remember. But uh, I know there's definitely been some talk about uh, Peter Jackson a adding in some appendixes or whatever from different books, like the last book, uh, Return of the King, in that would fit into the story a little bit. But uh, um, but yeah, there's this scene, of course, yeah, one of my favorite parts of the book was Riddles in the Dark, and that was, of course, when Bilbo got the ring. Um, and of course it's introduced almost two hours into the movie, so we don't get the ring for a long time in this film. Uh, which is relatively good, so we can kind of get away from that and reestablish it as something new, something fresh. Uh, the only <laughs> bad thing was it wasn't well-paced uh, fresh stuff, so uh, I guess that's script, uh, screenwriters and editors' uh, faults there, but... Um, yeah, but definitely there's a scene, uh, Andy Serkis returns as Gollum, by the way, who looks better than he ever has before. He's kind of got that, a little bit of that motion capture, he's totally fake look to him, but the way his eyes work and everything just works, you, f you know, you totally, uh, get past that and you just think, that's Gollum. You don't think too much about it being CGI fake. Uh, certainly not. Uh, and that was, of course, the most entertaining part of the movie, by far. It's about ten minutes long. I'm glad that was the right scene to get, where you pace it out right. Because uh, all the riddles, they're fun, the audience tries to answer them before the characters do, and, uh, and it's just great, inter solid entertainment. Um, wonderful stuff there. Um, I'm trying to think, but, uh, just everything about that scene was just very, very entertaining. Uh, it was really funny because I mentioned in my other reviews, which if you haven't seen yet, go ahead and check them out, but uh, there's this Jekyll and Hyde thing that I mentioned in especially the Two Towers review, uh, where uh, Gollum kind of goes back and forth with himself 
There's a little bit of that in here, not too much, but a little bit. And uh, I feel like my hat's falling off or something. Yeah, I uh, I really appreciated that, and the audience I was with laughed at that. Like he's literally in mid sentence at one point, and he goes, "Shut up to himself," and it's <laughs> it's really funny. But uh, um, definitely at that point, the audience was ready to just sit back and have a good laugh, and that was a good laugh, that's for sure. And then uh, there was kind of a little bit of a battle scene that followed that, and um, and that was nice uh, to see. But it, it at times. Uh, this is another complaint I have, but then again, I can't remember from the book if it was this much or if it's just from, this is a movie, we got to make it action-packed, the difference between them. But uh, I remember in the book, there weren't too many action scenes that felt like rides at amusement parks. Uh, like, literally, there's this scene where they're escaping from goblins, which I'm not going to say spoiler alert or anything, because there's no spoilers here. I mean, you know it's eventually going to lead up and set up uh, the Lord of the Rings films, so... You know, that's, that's your loss. Uh, if you don't know what's going on, definitely find out what's going on before you see the last film in this new trilogy. There's this scene where they're captured by goblins and then uh, the the 13 dwarfs and Gandalf like try to escape. And they're like, there's all sorts of like different levels and stuff that they set up uh, that swing around, move around and stuff. Weird, weird stuff the goblins set up, but... Um, Literally, they come crashing down on one of them at one point, and you're just like, oh, come on. That thing is not, like, it's this big, unstable, wobbly, wooden thing. You're like, oh, come on, there's no way that thing, when it's falling down cliffs, for God's sakes, is going to stay together, and they're all going to turn out fine. Uh, you know, and then it gets worse when they're crushed by probably a three or four hundred pound goblin king, for God's sakes. Of course, if you've seen the preview, that's in it, but where they're like, well, that could have gone worse. Boom! You know, they get crashed. Which by the audience appreciated. And I thought, eh, that's okay. The humor in this film was kind of hit and miss. Sometimes it aimed for the lowest common denominator. Like, there was some burp jokes, and if I remember right, maybe some, you know, inferred flatulent jokes. But that doesn't, that doesn't fit in. No, no. I know you're trying to make The Hobbit different from Lord of the Rings, but not, that's, that's kind of crossing the line there a little bit. But, um... But certainly, there's um, some good moments in the film. Don't get me wrong. And then the last, I don't know, 15 minutes, you know, really sold, really sold it. You know, it was action packed. It was, uh, it had a message to it uh, that carries through the film. You know, that we've been questioning through the film. It was good stuff. But the thing is, that first act is just so troublesome and slow moving, and the second act doesn't really help all that much until, you know halfway through, that it gets, definitely, it's, it, this film gets docked. Uh, I think, to be fair, uh, 7 out of 10. Uh, it's uh, not a perfect film. It's not a film that's going to win Oscar, Oscars. It's not a film that's going to get nominated for Oscars. Uh, it's going to be the first film in this series, now directed by Peter Jackson, featuring Middle Earth, that will not get a Best Picture nomination. That's for sure. Uh, if and if the the uh, Academy nominates it, they're you know they've obviously missed out on something, or they've you know they've definitely uh, got something wire. The wiring in here isn't all at home or something. But uh, but certainly um, there are some great moments. For example, the, yeah, the riddles in the dark and the whole last I don't know 45 minutes or so of the film really is something you have to see. Uh, whether you wait for it on DVD or if you see it in the theater or not, uh, definitely see it, uh, especially if you're an LOTR fan. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything I've missed here that I want to shout out or, or uh, I don't think so, but 7 out of 10, it's, it's not entirely weak. I, I walked out uh, and I said uh, there were a few people there who were kind of asking my opinion of, you know, you know, what'd you think of it? And I said, well, it didn't disappoint. And that's that's true. It didn't disappoint. Uh, if it was disappointing, then it would have been a 5 out of 10. A uh, 6 out of 10 would have been, well, it was kind of lackluster, but it had moments that worked. 7 out of 10 means there's some good moments, but there's also some stuff in here that they really should have fixed. There's some stuff in here that we just have to say, well, they just, uh, they just didn't think that through all the way. Uh, there's definitely some moments, and it, don't get me wrong, I'm not any less excited for the next two films. 
and I'm not going to go shout out to Peter Jackson and the, and the crew, make the next two films into one, go against the studio even if it loses you your job, save us the pity. No, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say that. I definitely say just release the film, make the film at, if you, you know, the way you want to make it, but just take the criticisms that you've been given now about the pacing of the first, you know, um, of the first, you know, ha hour of the film and fix it. Definitely fix it. Um, and then uh, one thing I've heard, um, and I have, uh, I saw it in 2D. I saw it in 2D, the regular 24 frames per second rate. I've been hearing that the 3D and the 48 frames per second combined doesn't uh, reduce headaches, it increases them. Uh, and it, not to the point where it's a medical condition, no way. But to, just for some people, it just becomes almost like a migraine to sit through. And literally, if there's nothing exciting on screen to happen for that, I just feel so sorry for those people that have to deal with that. But definitely, see this in 2D. Uh, I saw it in 2D, and I never thought for a moment that there was a f there was something that would that was bothering me. Uh, but uh, definitely uh, go see the movie. It's already made 13 million from midnight shows alone. That's that's impressive. December the highest uh, before this I read was uh, Avatar with three million. This has four times that. Plus, it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is big. This is definitely uh, now on track to close to a hundred million dollar uh, opening. And um, actually, some people actually have been speculating it might pass over that and go up to close to or closer to 120 million for the weekend, which would which would knock my socks off. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, no uh, pun intended there as far as the barefooted hobbits in the film. But uh, certainly I am excited for the next two. I am uh, definitely glad to see the achievements that they got in this film as far as visual effects and stuff. The score was great. The cinematography was great. Everything technically was fine. But it's just the storyline and the pacing and somewhat the editing just needs a little tweaking. And then you have a film that is the equivalent of Lord of the Rings. It would be as good, but it just has these moments that just cripple it to the point where I just have to dock it. Uh, but, yeah, let's just say, if the riddles in the dark scene had been taken any different, that scene, as it was shot, as it was shown, bumped this film up a whole uh, one point, uh, which is really, really hard to do in my, in, as far as my judging of films. It's really hard to do. But uh, certainly, certainly, see The Hobbit, uh, and I guess, uh, do this crap, sign off, and you have my review.